now we'll begin with the bacterial infections so uh, the important bacterial infection that we'll discuss today is impetigo contagiosa please remember that impetigo contagiosa is the most common bacterial infection it is also called as non bullous impetigo so basically impetigo literally if you see the meaning of impetigo it means to attack okay so impetigo can be of two types it can be non bullous impetigo and bullous impetigo okay if you see the cause of bullous impetigo is most of the times staphylococcal non bullous impetigo can be staphylococcal or streptococcal okay now first let's go to impetigo contagiosa that is non bullous impetigo as i mentioned it's the most common infection bacterial infection to occur in children the exposed areas are affected like the face is a common site in the world staphylococcus aureus uh, is more commonly responsible for this infection as compared to streptococcus pyogenes but in warmer climates like in india and in the developing countries we see that it is more likely because of streptococci than staphylococci okay so it's more caused because of streptococcal infection than staphylococcal infection in india now what happens is that the initial uh, uh, the initial lesion is usually a vesicle okay and this vesicle it's very transient within a few hours this particular vesicle it is covered by a honey colored crust okay it ruptures it forms an erosion and this erosion gets covered with a honey colored crust so remember the honey colored crust you can see in the image here the honey colored crust is something that is very very classical for a diagnosis of impetigo contagiosa the complications when it is caused by streptococcal infection is post streptococcal glomerulonephritis when it is caused by the m49 strain of streptococci how do you treat since it's a bacterial infection you will have to give an antibiotic so the antibiotic can include uh dicloxacillin amoxicillin clavulanic acid cefalexin and you can give topical uh, uh antibiotics like uh, mupirocin and fusidic acid okay so that is how you treat non bullous impetigo or impetigo contagiosa the reason it is called as impetigo contagiosa is because you can transmit this very easily okay then next is bullous impetigo please remember that the other name of bullous impetigo is pemphigus neonatrum okay so pemphigus neonatrum do not confuse it with neonatal pemphigus neonatal pemphigus is because of the passive transfer of the antibodies through the placenta from the mother to the child giving rise to the presence of blistering in a neonate which is very transient So oh, that is neonatal pemphigus, which is transplacentally transmitted. This is pemphigus neonatrum, which is nothing but bullous impetigo. Okay, so bullous impetigo is caused by Staphylococcus aureus. Now, what happens is that this Staphylococcus aureus releases a toxin. This toxin is called as the epidermolytic toxin. This epidermolytic toxin it leaves the desmoglein one. which is present in the desmosome which is present in the subcorneal level as a result of which there is appearance of a blister okay now because of the blister and the infection you see that there is pus within the blister and this pus it settles at the lower end of the blister as you can see in this picture you can see the pus settling at the lower end of the blister and this is called as the hypopion sign so remember hypopion sign is seen in bullous impetigo okay now this epidermolytic toxin usually is excreted out through the kidney okay but if the child is less than 5 years of age the epidermolytic toxin may not be removed out from the system that's because what can happen is that these children they have an they have uh, an incompetent kidney as yet okay to remove that toxin out hence there may be accumulation of that toxin and hematogenous spread of the toxin and that can give rise to staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome which can be a complication of bullous impetigo if not controlled at the right stage 
right so staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome it's basically a condition which is caused by the dissemination of the toxin which is called as the epidermolytic toxin okay on histopathology of bullous impetigo you see that there will be a subcorneal blister and uh, within it there will be neutrophils and uh, that is of course because there is pus right so this is the hypopion sign as you can see here the pus is heavier so it has got accumulated at the base of the blister so now let's discuss a very very important topic that is staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome so basically as i mentioned that in infants okay and children who are less than 5 years of age the, whenever there is an infection anywhere in the body which is caused by staphylococcus aureus group uh, uh, phage type 2 this particular staphylococcus aureus releases a toxin which, which is called as the epidermolytic toxin and this epidermolytic toxin targets the desmoglein 1 which is present at the subcorneal level this desmoglein 1 is a part of the desmosome and because there is damage to the desmosome there is loss of the intercellular attachment as a result of which there is primary acantholysis which happens and that eventuates in the uh, in a blister okay so because there is hematogenous dissemination of this toxin you will see that the child will present with fever there will be widespread blistering of the skin okay and after that you will see that you when you try and perform a nikolsky sign it will come out to be positive so what is a nikolsky sign when you look at a blister you look at the surrounding normal skin and when you apply shearing force on the surrounding normal looking skin initially you will feel the epidermis moving over the underlying dermis and then the epidermis will be peeled off so that is the epidermal peeling sign also called as the nikolsky sign which is positive in patients with staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome another very characteristic feature is that these children they develop perioral crusting erosions and scaling so this is something very classically seen in staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome and please remember that since this toxin is targeting only desmoglein 1 and desmoglein 1 is present only in the skin it is absent in the oral cavity and the other mucosae that is why mucosal involvement does not happen in staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome so the blisters they rupture they lead to widespread separation of the skin the skin surface is fragile and it shears off easily giving rise to erosions as you can see in this picture and that is called as the nikolsky sign positive on histopathology you will see a very similar picture to that of bullous impetigo you will see a subcorneal cleft you will see the presence of uh, neutrophils right so now this is a very very important table which you need to remember and this is will this will tell you how to differentiate between staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome pemphigus vulgaris and sjs10 so remember in staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome it is a disease of the children who are less than 5 years of age pemphigus vulgaris usually happens in middle age that is at around 40 years of age Toxic epidermal necrolysis can happen at any age but it is more commonly seen in adults. Mucosal involvement will not happen in staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome because the desmoglein 1 only is involved which is absent in the mucosae. Pemphigus vulgaris involves both antibodies against desmoglein 1 as well as desmoglein 3. Since desmoglein 3 is present in the mucosae that is why mucosal involvement is something that is very classically seen in pemphigus vulgaris. In SJS and 10, by definition, there has to be mucosal involvement. So, definitely mucosal involvement is seen in SJS and 10. Targetoid lesions, which are atypical targets where you see only two zones, that is the central uh, zone of dusky erythema and the peripheral zone of erythematous flare. And uh, that these are the two zones which are seen in the atypical targets or targetoid lesions, which are classically seen in patients with SJS and 10. Targetoid lesions are not seen in SSSS or in pemphigus vulgaris. Perioral scaling and crusting as I mentioned is classically seen in staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome. On histopathology, on staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome, you will see acantholytic cells uh, which will be present in within a subcorneal blister. While in pemphigus vulgaris, the level of the blister will be suprabasal 
and you will see the presence of acantholytic cells within the blister. In 10 and SDS, what we see is an intrabasal split and subepidermal blistering with the presence of necrotic keratinocytes. So, this is a very helpful table to differentiate between these three very confusing entities. Now, here this is a second uh, condition which is called as ecthyma. Ecthyma is remember caused by staphylococci or streptococci more commonly with streptococci. It is characterized by the presence of a thick adherent crust and when this thick adherent crust is removed, it creates an ulcer. It is common on the extremities especially in the elderly patients in diabetes and in patients with poor hygiene. So, this is ecthyma which is a thick adherent crust, when you remove the crust, you will see an ulcer. So, another ecthyma that you need to remember is ecthyma gangrenosum. Ecthyma gangrenosum, please remember, is caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa and uh, it is a uh, kind of a dermatological emergency. It can cause hemorrhagic necrosis and septicemia. Then you should know what is ecthyma contagiosum. Ecthyma contagiosum is the other name for ORF. Okay, and the other name of ORF is contagious pustular dermatosis. It's a viral infection which is caused by the parapox virus. So, do not confuse if they ask you ecthyma, it is caused by staph or strepto. Ecthyma gangrenosum is caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And ecthyma contagiosum is a viral infection which is ORF, which is also called as contagious pustular dermatosis.